So for the workshop of today, we ne you need to go on this URL because every challenge that we'll do together to build our landing page, they are described here. So we have only two hours to code from scratch the landing page. And to save time, I will ask you sometimes to copy paste some code, right? So here, if you scroll, you have, you have all the different exercises that we'll go through in the workshop. So you can just go, everyone can go on this URL to be ready to, to work on the challenges. So it's levagon.github.io slash landing, all right? And then that will that, uh, we'll, we'll be able to go really uh, fast in the workshop. Okay, so in the startup world, when we speak a landing page, it's just like you want to test a concept, you want to make a proof of concept, you make a website with only one page, which is called a landing page. And your landing page needs to fulfill some kind of uh, requirements. So it needs to really state your value proposition. So someone who arrives on the landing page, he should understand in two seconds what your service is about. So it's, it should be really straightforward. I understand what the proposition value of this startup when I arrive on the landing page, right? Secondly, your design should be really good because right now the standard in design, in web design, they are really, really high. So if you want people to, uh, to, uh, to trust you and to, to, to think it's not bullshit, you have to really have a nice design for your landing page, okay? Second requirement. Third requirement, it's a landing page, so it's not just for, for, the, for the, you know, the, it's to capture some mails, right? So you need to have a call to action. It's not like as a, as a flyer or as a poster in the underground. You need to have some, some button or some uh, email form that people will be able to leave their mail. And then your job as an entrepreneur is to bring traffic on the landing page. But to test your ID, your job is to, to know what percentage of the users coming on your landing page are actually leaving their mail, which means that maybe they won't pay for this service. That's your job to make them pay. But that means that they show some interest. When they, they, they see your proposition value, it rings a bell for them, right? And they leave their mail. So you need to have a call to action. Otherwise, it's useless, a landing page without call to action. Is it OK, call to action, for anyone? It's an email form, basically. And the thing that people don't really think about the landing page, it basically, that's the first milestone of your CRM system. Because from the moment you have mails, then you can just, you know, try to reach the guys to know why they are interested in you. You, you, sh you should not like just say, OK, I've got uh, 500 mails. That means that my product is awesome. No, you, you, you have to engage the discussion with the guys. Maybe you can also put these mails on other service if you want to be a pirate. But it's the, it's the, you know, the milestone of your CRM system, right? And you, you should see it like that. So maybe, I don't know if you know about uh, these services. Maybe they are obsolete, maybe they are new ones because there are lots of uh, landing page services. But you are not obliged to code to build a landing page. So I know you guys are here to code, actually. But the point is, there are lots of service that enables you to basically put a landing page online without having to write a single line of CSS or HTML, right? So there is LaunchRock, Strikingly, Squarespace, Unbounce, and I'm sure there are dozens of other ones, like, and good ones. Just if you are, want to be a bit lazy, you're not obliged to cut it from scratch, even if for me that's interesting skill to have. So for this workshop, we are going to build it from scratch. Basically, what we are going to do is to build a static website, pretty simple, because with only one HTML file, right? But when you build a, a static website, you can use three technologies. That's the, tr the three languages that's that, that are understood by your web browser. And these three uh, uh, programming languages, they are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So do you know what's HTML? It's for what, actually? Yeah. It's a markup language, and it's just to structure the content of your web page, right? To put some kind of scaffold on your contents. Then CSS is for the design. It's like to make it look nice. And JavaScript, OK, so that's really a language that can be used for lots of stuff right, uh, nowadays, but you can also use it to animate your content. So you have a content, you design it, and then you can also add some animations. When you click on some buttons, some other like, list will appear, or there, there will be some kind of animations when the user interacts with your page. And tonight, we are also going to use uh, a CSS library. Because as a developer, you're lazy. You want to reuse CSS code that are, has been developed by other guys. And there are two main CSS libraries right now. There is this, this guy at the right. This is Bootstrap. So this is a CSS library coded by guys from Twitter. 
and it's really, really popular. It's being used by any startup right now. And the one on the right, it's material design. So that's from Google. It's uh, more recent. And that's also the CSS uh, library from Google, guys. OK? With different uh, design guidelines. So just to explain the, the flow of the workshops. This is really important because if you want not to be lost, you have to respect a bit this flow. So I'll make some short theori uh, theoretical uh, introductions to speak about the basic concept about HTML and CSS. And then uh, I'll make some demo, right? Some live demo building my page. And I suggest you, you don't try to, to make it at the same time because otherwise you'll miss the tiny details that are really important at the end. So, so you just interact and try to follow it. Uh, and then I leave you like sometimes, maybe one or two minutes each time, to actually make it. And for that, you can use the web page with all the challenges to maybe copy paste some code and save time, not to, to code it from scratch, right? OK, so let's go. So for this front end uh, for, uh, workshop, we need two tools. So this is a browser. So what's the point of a browser, actually? It's the, it's the software that enables to actually make you visualize your web page, right? It interprets the HTML and CSS code and gives you a result, a graphical result for that. And the guy on the right is a text editor. Because when you code, you don't code with Microsoft Word. That's not the place where you write your code. You need some more like adapted tool that will recognize the language, maybe put some colors on the keywords, you know, and help you code, actually. So that's why we are going to use this text editor, which is Sublime Text. Okay? So let's set up. So I show you, then you can go on the web page and see the instruction and try to do the same. So the setup is really, really important because you need to get, to get really a nice environment to code. Otherwise, it's painful. So I show you. So I have my browser open on the, on the right. And just I will create a new folder for my project. So right click, new folder, and I name it. And then we need to open Sublime Text. So I will just launch Sublime Text. And that opens a new file here, an empty one. So be careful. That's important. That's the important part. I take my folder here, and I just drag and drop it in my window. OK? And the thing is, like, why it's a good text editor is because here I can see the architecture of my files. So I'm, I have not like dozens of files open, you know, and I have to switch. All my files will be here on the same window. That really makes my life as a coder really you know, easier. And here I can add some new files. So right click, new file. It opens an untitled file, and I have to save it. So I save it. OK, Command S or Control S on Windows. And I have to, to put the name of the file. So the first file of a, of a static website, what is it, actually? Yeah, so index, but we'll, try, we'll start with a playground file. OK, that's not the definitive one. But it's an HTML file. So I will name it playground. OK. Dot, what's the extension? Yeah, it's an HTML file, right? And here, as you can see, I got my file on the left navigation. Then, if I want to design my page, what do I need? Another file, so I create a new one and I save it again. What's the name of this file to design? What kind of file is it? CSS. It's a CSS file. That's where I write the, de the design code. And so the convention is to, to name it like style.css. OK? <coughs> so I have the file for my contents. I have the file for my design. And I also need a folder to put my images. Because in a website, if you want to be lively, the website, you need to have some images. So here, right click, and I create a new folder this time. Not a file, a folder. And on the bottom, I can name it. So images. Here, I enter, and then I've got the skeleton of my project. So it's pretty simple. One HTML file where, where I will write my content, one CSS file for my design, and one folder, for the moment it's empty, to put my images. So now I have my HTML file, and I need to visualize my website when I build it. So what's the tool to visualize the website? It's my brother, right? It's already open on the, on, the, on the right. And so here you have two options. Either you go, you open your folder, and you double click on the HTML file that will open it on the browser. OK? Or the fancy way in Macintosh is like just you are in your HTML file. You take the icon at the top, you click it, and you drag and drop it on a new tab. OK? 
But the easy way is like you just double click on the HTML file. It's okay with that? So now I've got the perfect setup. On the left, I will write my code. And on the right, I will see my website like, and, and, and refresh when I'm building my website. So let's say I will start with like, we are, are done, some title just to test. I save my file, I go on my browser, I refresh, and I see the results. And that's the way I'm going to work. I'm going to code here, save my files, go back to my browser, refresh, and see the results. And back and forward, right? So if you want to get the instruction, well, it's on this page, and it's the first challenge, let's set up, right? So you can follow it a bit. Try to go slow when you name your file. Don't rush just to have the good setup for that. As I told you, there are three front-end languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And so HTML, for me, is the most important one because it's to structure the content of your page. And you, if the structure is not good, you, you can't even think about designing the page or animating the page. It's like you want to paint a building. If you don't put the good scaffold on the building, you won't be able to paint it, right? So HTML is the most important thing. Good HTML means good design and means good animation at the end. CSS for the design, JavaScript for the animation and other stuff. And as I told you, without structure, no design. Don't think about it. So let's start with HTML. So HTML is a pretty simple language. It's just a markup language. So it uses tags, and tags are a way to identify the different content of your page. So here, for instance, I've got three different contents, right? These are three texts. And the, the, the philosophy of HTML is to put some tags to identify these different content. Okay? So here, the first, I put it a tag H1. That means that the, the main header. The second one, secondary header, H2. And the third one, paragraph of text, P. So that's the, the, the philosophy behind HTML. I tag the content. And what happens when I tag the content? Well, the browser will apply some default rules. For instance, a main header is bigger than, than a secondary header, right? And a paragraph of text is smaller. So the browser will apply some default style. And the nice thing is that then, with our CSS, we'll be able to override this style. Because we have some tags to identify the content, select it, and design it. Okay? So if we want the main header to be blue in some different font, font family, we can do it then in the CSS and override the default rules of the browser. So do you know the main tags of a, an HTML file? What's the main, main, the global one, the most global one? HTML. HTML, OK? That's the, it, it begins here. The closing tag is here. That means that my HTML code is actually between these two guys. It begins here, and it's, it's, it stops here, actually. It's in between, OK? So that's the most global tag. And within this HTML tag, I've got two important sections in my file which are the head. It's a bit as in the human body. You've got the head, and then you've got the body, right? Basically, what's inside your head? Your brain. So the head is not the content that will be displayed on the page. So all the content, all the text, all the image that you can see on the page, it's not in the head. It's in the body. But in the head, we'll put all the intelligence of the page. That's what we call sometimes metadata. So the meta information. So for instance, the link to the design file. Design is not content, it's intelligence, right? It's trying to, 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 put the, to put the content in a nice way. So each time you need to copy-paste some code, ask yourself, is it some actual content of my page? Or is it some kind of intelligence that I want to add to my file? And if it's some kind of intelligence, put it in the head. So if I go on Google and I, I make a search, so I say, Le Wagon Coding School, right? And I push Enter. And here, as you can see, OK, we are French, so the, the, the SEO is not that good in, uh, in English. It will come, it will come. But what can we see here? That there is uh, the link to Le Wagon website. And there is this text, Le Wagon Formation Developer Web Coding Bootcamp. So it's in French, but. And why is Google putting this text here? How does it know which text to print, actually? How does it know that? And it's the same for here. It says, change your life, learn to code with the best coding school in Europe. OK, maybe Google knows that we are the best coding school in Europe, but 
To be honest, that's something I wrote in my HTML file, right? And again, that's, this is some kind of marketing description <coughs> that Google has to take somewhere. So these two information, if we, if we go on Le Wagon website and we open the source code to see the HTML of the file, in the head section here, we can find the title tag and that states Le Wagon Formation Developer Web Coding Bootcamp. So that's exactly this information that Google is using to display the text of the link. So that's really important because if you don't care about that, then you Google uh, like search, like the, the, the text of your Google results, they are shit, right? So you, you need to put some nice keywords within this title. And here above, we can find another metadata, which is the meta description. And we can, like, I don't know if you see, maybe I can zoom a bit. And it say, change your life, learn to code, blah, blah, blah. That's exactly the text that was displayed by Google, the marketing description. Again, you have to add it to your code if you want Google to be able to display it on the search. Let me give you another example. I will go on Facebook. And I will try to share, like, let's check HTTP levagon, sorry, dot com. And here, just by magic, Facebook is inserting a card with a nice pictures and again with a title here and a description here. Again, how Facebook knows what information to display on the card when I share the URL. There is no magic here. And if I look at the, at the source code, so that's the English source code actually, well, I scroll a bit in the head, that's in the head, that's intelligence. And you have all these guys who are called the open, <coughs> open graph metadata. That's the metadata used by Facebook to display the cards on the social network. And here I can retrieve the open graph, let's say, description, which is Le Wagon is Europe best coding school for entrepreneurs. So exactly the text used as the description on the second line. I can find the open graph title, which is uh, here, Le Wagon learned to code bootcamp in Ruby on Rails. And if we look here, there is an image. So let's open it to see. And this image is exactly the image used by Facebook to be injected into this card. Okay, so in the source code, basically you have to care about the head. Because there is lots of intelligence that are responsible for the design of your page, but not only that are responsible for the Google search, or the way it will look, and for the, also the, the, the sharing of your page on the social networks. And you have the same for Twitter, you have the same for Instacart. So if you want not to be ridiculous when you share your URL of your brand new product, uh, be careful because otherwise some geek developer will say, ha ha ha, your, you know, your metadata are shit. Okay? So you have to be careful about that. So in the slides, I will share the slide with you. I give you some examples. So the title is the one used by Google. And you have also some intelligence to interpret some special characters. So you, if you have some characters with accent or special ones, you need to say to your page to add some intelligence so that the page will be able to interpret these kind of weird characters with accent, for instance. We have accent in, in, in France, actually. We do have. Sorry for that. So, so we need this, this guy, we need it, the car set. OK, so the title and the description used by Google, the open graph tags used by Facebook, and there are lots of other metadata you can find in, in the head. Let's go a bit deeper into HTML and into all the, the tags that we can use within the body, within really the, the body of your page. So the nice thing with HTML is like you don't need to make a PhD and five years of learning like, in, like uh, other programming language. It's not really a programming language. It's just a markup language. So you just need to respect the syntax, and then that's it. You know HTML. You are uh, HTML uh, developers, if you know that. But you have to respect this syntax. So how does it work? It's always a bit the same. You have an opening tag, right, and a closing tag, just to encapsulate, to wrap the content. To be able to identify it, you have to wrap it. And in the opening tag, we can find what we call attributes. It's kind of options to add some kind of intelligence to the tag. OK? So the vocabulary is important because when you want to ask questions to Google, you have to use the good keywords. So this is called a tag or an element. It's called the opening tag and the closing tag. And in the opening tag, we can add attributes, HTML attributes. OK? So I'll give you an example of that. 
What's the name of the tag here? What's the keyword for the tag? It's A. So that's the tag for a link, actually. OK? What's the content of the tag? Is the text Le Wagon? So that will be the text displayed on the page. And what are the two attributes that I use here in this case? The first one is href, and the value is like the URL of the link. OK, so href is the attribute responsible for the URL of the link. And the second one, target, basically it enables you to open the link on a new tab in the browser so that the user it doesn't lose the navigation on your website. That's important because otherwise, you know, you make the user less, leave your website actually. So if you want it to be open on a new tab, you can use this second attribute, target. That's OK. With, is, is the vocabulary OK for everyone? You have the tag, and then you have the attributes. So these guys, you know them? For, for, for what kind of information is it? For headers. So H1 is the big header, and then secondary header, they are smaller and smaller. For paragraph of text, what's the tag? <coughs> it's P, right? Then if you need to focus on some part of the, of the text, you can use emphasize or strong to put the, the part of the text in bold characters, actually. So there, is, there are two kinds of lists. UL, it, state, it stands for unordered list, so it's with bullet points, actually, the one you, you mentioned. And OL, it stands for ordered lists. That means with indexes, like 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And as you can see sometimes, the tag, they are nested. So here, the UL tag is for the list itself, right? It's the list tag. And inside, we have other tags that we use, li. And li stands for list item. It's all the tag for the different items of the list. This one, it's uh, for images, because that's nice to have a website with text, but it's also nice to put some images. So what's the, the, like, what's the funny thing with the image tag? What, can you notice something about this guy? Yeah, there is no need for a closing tag. Because actually, in the source attribute here, here the src attributes, you already specify the path to the file of the image, right? So there is no need to put some kind of content between a, a start tag and an end tag. You already specify the file uh, of the image within the source attributes. So this one is a bit special. It doesn't need to be closed, actually. Now it's the most painful part of the workshop because we have to, we have to write some contents in the page. We need to put the skeleton of the of the HTML file. So what's the main tag? HTML. HTML. And I suggest you guys, you always you don't write hit. You don't write the, this kind of uh, lower or equal character. Just write the name of the tag in Sublime Text and hit tab, and it will auto complete the clo the the starting tag and the closing tag. Okay, use that a lot. Just write the name of the tag. OK, so we have the main HTML tag and two sections inside. Which ones? Head and OK, body. Thank you for the interaction. OK, so in the head, if we want to have a good, a good uh, uh, text for the link on Google, what do we have to, to put? A title. So let's say landing page. OK, I'll dezoom a bit. And maybe we can add a description, but let's keep uh, just a title. And then in the body, what do we find on a landing page? What's the canonical design of a landing page when you arrive on a landing page? An image. Yeah, you have a banner with a background image. You have the name of the service. OK? You have the, pro like the proposition value, the call to action, and then some cards describing the features of your website. OK, it's fast, it's uh, blah, 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 it's in the cloud, it's, uh, it's uh, data, data based or whatever. So we have to, so we add the, the background image in the end of the workshop, but let's start with the text and the image. So we have the main, the name of the service. So let's say my playground app here, and then the description in the paragraph of text. So actually, the, the second line is the one that everyone is reading. It has been proven by scientists. So you need to focus on this line. This is the really important line. OK? There is a UX, uh, UX PhD thesis about, the, about this line, actually. No, I'm kidding. I hope not. OK, so there is the main banner with the name 
of the service with the description of the proposition value of your service and a call to action. So a call to action, here we start with a link, let's say unroll or something like that, and I will put a dead link, so without any URL for the, for the link. And let's say unroll, okay? And then we are going to describe the service. So, I, I don't know, you, you know most uh, websites for startups that describe the service and, and it's kind of like features and each time you have some kind of image, some icon describing the feature, some text to, to give the name of the feature and some paragraph of text to say a bit more details about the feature, right? So for the image, what's the feature, what's the tag that I should use actually? IMG. Yeah, IMG. So here, I, I have to, to find an image for that. So let's say I want to say that my service is fast and then I will use an H2 I will say fast, and then a paragraph of text. This is a fast app, very fast app. OK? And then, basically, if we have four features, we can just take the same structure for our four features. So, IMG, uh, like the, the, the title for the feature and the description of the feature, four times. Okay, so let's say my service is fast. My service is also what? Come on. Simple. Yeah, it's simple. And what else? Awesome. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then? So the HTML is always the, you know, the painful time because we have to find some content here. So that takes time actually. <laughs> And so it's really painful, actually. <laughs> <laughs> this is a painful, sorry. And maybe, because the problem with the link is like the link is an inline element. So if I want to have a break of the line, I have to wrap my link into a paragraph of text, actually. So here I have my main banner. So for instance, there is no background for the image, just a text, a description, and a call to action. And then I have my four features here with these guys, my four features describing the service. And then at the bottom of the page, what do I need? A footer, right? So let's, let's keep a simple footer, which is just a paragraph of text for the moment. So if I look at my page, I refresh, here I have the first content for my web page. So the main description of my service, the four features, and the footer. And you will see just a bit of CSS and boom, that's a landing page. I know you don't trust me, but you'll see. So here it's not like uh, pictures, it's like I need icons to describe the features. So what's the ser what are the services that you, you know to find icons? I don't know if there are, de there are designers. Bootstrap it's a CSS library, it's not really about icons. They have kind of internal icons, but they're not really well designed. Noun project? Yeah, noun project, so it's the the most, the most uh, well-known service, it's like the noun project. So that's basically a platform where all the designers are putting some uh, icon uh, uh, files. So what do you want to, f to look for, actually? I know it's uh, Escape the City, so we are looking for a briefcase. And here, I have lots of different icons for briefcase, okay? The one I like a uh, lot is like called Nucleo app, and so basically they have a color, colorful icons. That's nice to have like some kind of colors, because the non-project is it, just black and white, and it's a bit sad. It's nice to have some colors in the icons. And so here, um, I think Nucleo app, they have a free pack here. It's a bit hidden, you have to dig to find it. It's there on the, left, on the right, and there are lots of nice colorful icons inside this uh, free pack actually. So again, to save time, on the main, here, on the second exercise, I've prepared already some icons that, that come from Nucleo app uh, free pack, actually. So if you download, you have this kind of icons. So I will just uh, right-click and save these images. Where do I save them, actually? So I go to the desktop, landing, and within the image folder. So the first one, it's called brief case. 
the second one, okay, diamond. Okay, and the last one is just a computer, so laptop. And here in my Sublime Text Editor, I can see in my image folder, I've got my four guys, my four images, right? So it's a SVG file, that's a vectorial uh, file format. And what do I need to, to, to do in my source here, actually? To put the path to the file. Okay, so when we speak about f uh, file path, you always have to start with the file you're in, actually. Now I'm within the HTML file, right? So what's my current folder? What's the folder I'm inside? It's the landing folder, okay? So that's the starting point where I will dig for files, actually. And if I need to find the image, I first have to, to go in which folder? Images. I know it's like rhetorical questions, but if you can say just uh, the answer, is like, it's nice for me. Images, uh, and here I just have to put the name of the file. So the first one is like briefcase, okay? The second one is like diamond. Third one is heart, and then laptop. Okay. And if I go back to my landing page, I've got my different icons for my describing my service, actually. So there is, it doesn't mean fast nor simple, but let's pretend it's, it's represent this kind of concepts. Okay. First question. Yeah? Does it have to be um, SVG? No, you can have like PNG, uh, JPEG, yeah. they don't have transparency. So if you have a colorful background, then you, you will see a white box. It will be ugly. Yeah. But PNG, this has some trans transparency. Yeah. So you can use PNG. Okay. It's just I was lazy, I, I downloaded the free pack and I just That's put the, idea. yeah. But you can use PNG. SVG, which is good, is like, it's a vectorial format. So you can, if you have, uh, you want to have some advanced design, you can, make, you can make animation when you hover on the image and change the internal colors of the shapes. Okay. That's what's uh, SVG. Uh, when you have a, a fancy website and when you hover on an icon and change, the yeah. colors, that's SVG, actually. Okay. That's not PNG. PNG is like static format yeah, yeah. with transparency. Okay. okay, guys, so now I think that's uh, the most boring part of the workshop. <laughs> and for that, uh, we have to add some content. And for that, please use, start with this code canvas. Don't, don't write all the things like myself. Just copy paste this, this ones in the HTML file. Just save these guys into your image folder, and then we can make some funny things with uh, CSS and web design, right? So let's speak about CSS, because now that we have some content, uh, that would be nice to display it like it's shit for the moment. It's like Times New Roman and uh, the, the, you know, the, the links that are in a dirty blue with uh, some lines, like, that's not really good. So if you go on any website, let's say Le Wagon, and just to play a bit with the website, you, you want to kill so here, when you open the inspector, so we'll, I'll use uh, a lot the inspector. So the inspector, you can right click and say inspect here, and that will open the Geek console at the bottom, enab enabling you to play with the HTML here and the CSS on the right, okay? So I'll use a lot the, this kind of uh, tool to play dynamically with my page and make some experiments. Th that's my playground, actually. And here, if I take the head, I click on the head on the HTML, and I just cut it. This is the Wagon website without any CSS because the link to the style sheet is in the head. So here you see what the website looks like without any CSS. As you can see, the links that are all these in Times New Roman, in the font family Times New Roman. The links that are in kind of like, a, when they are already visited, it's purple. The, the, the list, they have some bullet points, right, here. And actually, what's, what's, what's this uh, HTML part here? Can you guess? So what kind of element is it? The menu. But in terms of HTML tags, what is it? Yeah. It's a list. It's a list with list item, but each list item, what is it? It's a link. So this is basically a navigation. It's a list where each list item is a link. UL, LI, A. That's the structure of navigation. Just I finish and I take a question. And so here is a list, and if I put some design, Cities, program, fac, 
that, that is a navigation, okay? So navigation is just a list of links with some CSS design. It's not a fancy thing, it's just a list of links with design, okay? Just to make you understand the structure behind. So, basically the web without CSS will be ugly, like Facebook it will be like just bullet points with purple links. So we have to, to code some CSS. So we'll code the, C the CSS code in the CSS file, that makes sense. But then, your HTML file, it's not because there is some other CSS file that by magic it's, it's, it knows that it is here. So in the HTML file, within the head, you have to make a link to the CSS file where you code your design, right? So in, your, in our HTML, we'll put a link in the head to the CSS file to say to the HTML file, well, go and, and look for the design in this CSS file. So HTML is not that easy because everything ne is nested, so it's a bit of a complex code. CSS is for kids. It's really, really easy to understand. So when we want to design something, first we have to select the elements of the page that we want to design. And for that we'll use what we call a CSS selector. So first I will introduce some simple selector, and then in the workshop I will introduce more and more advanced selector. It's a way to select the, I, the element of the page that you want to design. And then between the brackets, you will specify all the rules to design these elements. And the rules is like a keyword, a property, okay, colon, and the value for it. And it ends with a semicolon. So let's take an example. <coughs> what do I do in this slide, for instance? What, what are the guys that I'm selecting here? All the secondary headers, okay? Not the H1, not the H3, just the H2 guys. And what do I state? What the design I want to apply on them? I say, I want you to be red, I want you to have a font size of 20 pixels, and I want you to use the font family Arial. That's really straightforward. You describe the design you want on the items you have selected with the selector, okay? So we are going to start with all the CSS properties uh, to design the font and the colors, because that's where we, you start when you are a designer. Before going into advanced design, you have to fix your font scheme and your color scheme for the, for the whole website. If you are a good designer, you start this way. So the color property here is to fix the color of the text, not the background color, it's the, for the color of the text. And there are di different systems uh, to encode the colors. So for native colors, you have some keywords, like orange, red, green, but you'd never use them because they are ugly, just to know that the, this keyword exists. And so the other systems, there is this one, which is called the hexadecimal system. So that's a way to encode a color, but I'm sure you don't know that this is an orange. I don't know neither, so it's kind of hard to understand. And there are these two other systems, RGB and RGBA. I don't know if there are some designers in the room, but what RGB stands for, actually? Red, Red, green, blue. And all the values are between 0 and 255, and that means that when you mix all of them, you can basically have any colors of the color scheme, right? And the RGBA is, a, is slightly different from RGB because there is a fourth parameter that drives the transparency. So if it's 1, that means that it's not transparent. If it's 0, it's totally transparent, so you don't see the color. And in between, you see the color, but it's a bit transparent, so you can see the background, okay? Just I give you some tips, which is really useful, because when you do web design, your best friend is the grayscale. You can use purple or what, try to be fancy, but really what you need to do is apply some, 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 uh, some light grays and dark grays. And with the RGB system, if you pick the same value for red, green, and blue, then you are on the, on the grayscale. So 0, 0, 0, it's a black, 255, three times, it's a white. And in between, uh, you're just going through the gray scale, actually. So that's a nice tip to have in mind. I, I'll use it. So there are two properties for the color. Color is for text colors, and background color is for background color, okay. <laughs> no, what we'll do for the banner, you know, on the landing page, we don't have a color for the background, we have an image. So we have this other property that we'll use a bit later, it's the background image property. So we are done with colors, okay? Color, background color, then we pick the color and we are done. Then we have to design the fonts. And the fonts, you agree with me, a text, you can play on much more parameters to design the text. The first parameter is the font family itself. You have to pick the family that you want to use. So just for your like, general knowledge about the font, there are different families of fonts. This one is like serif font, 
So as you can see at the bottom of the A, yeah, there is this kind of um, there are this kind of dash. I don't know how to say that in English, but that, that's I think the they are called serif actually. Serif, yeah. are, these are the serifs here, okay? And what's the most famous serif fonts actually? Times. Times. Then you have sans serif. It's a French. I, I like it. <laughs> it's a sans serif um, a font. So we, we don't have the, the serif at the bottom of the A. And the most famous is Arial. Arial or Helvetica also. That's a sans serif font. Then you have monospace. That comes from the printing world, for the, from the newspaper world. Because we needed uh, to have uh, characters with the same width to, to get some alignment on the newspapers, right? For the printing machines. And so. The most common of the monospace font is Courier. Courier, right, for the newspapers. And then you have cursive fonts, that's the, the one that looks like uh, handwritten. Lots of different families, but that's the, th the three main families. So now that we have picked the fonts family, we can play on different things. We can play on the font size, so that's the, font, the size of the text. We can play on the, the, height, the, height, the height of the line. So what's the purpose of playing on the, light, on the line height, actually? When you have a paragraph of text and you want, you want it to breathe a bit, to separate the line. You want it to keep the same font size, but to make it breathe. You will play on the line height. And the last one that we, I think people forget about this one, but it's useful, is the letter spacing. And that's a nice one. It enables you to have some kind of nice design for some, for some, uh, some websites. I will show you. Then you can play on the color. We've seen these guys for the text. You can play on the text decoration, if you want to uh, have a, an underline text or, you know, on the text alignment with text align, if you want it to be justified on the left, on the right, or centered. <coughs> and you can play it on this guy, which is really important, that's the weight. So if you want some iOS uh, design with really thin, you know, font, or if you want some product hunt bold font, you can play on this parameter, actually. So let's make the design for the fonts and the colors of our website. So where do I start, actually? Come on, wake up, guys. Yeah, I will write my style here, right? But then in my HTML file, why do I need to do in the head? Because it's not clever, my HTML file. I have to tell it to link the CSS file. And so for that, I use the link tag here. And I will say the address, the file path of my CSS file. So here it's just style.css, right? And I'm ready to code my design. So I can start by selecting all the body and design the background of my main page and also the color of the text, my font family, this kind of stuff. So what background do we choose? Let's keep it simple. So that's the background of the body of my main, of all the page. What do I pick? OK, white. Or if I want a light gray, how do I do that? Light gray, sorry. So 255, three times it's a white. So I want just to kill a bit the white, like 200, let, let's say 40, OK? That's the tip about the gray scale. If you pick the same values, that's basically close to white, but that's a gray. Then for the color of the text. What color for the text? Yeah, or black is a bit shining, so I want to kill the black a bit. So. I kill the black a bit, OK? And then if I want to change the font family for my main, all the main text, let's say I want it to be Helvetica, for instance. By default, it's Times New Roman on a web page, by default. I will, switch, I will change it to Helvetica. And I think we are done with the body. Now what uh, we can just say the same. So it, this is for the main text, for the paragraph of text, or this kind of stuff. Ah, sorry, thank you. That's not, thank you. That's font, that's font family, right, guys? There is one, one, one person awake, and I'm, I'm proud of it. Great. <laughs> Keep like that. I want to have a buddy to correct my, my code. Thank you, mate. OK, so I designed, the des I designed the background and the colors and the fonts for the main text, OK, for my main page. Now I need to do the same for, for which, which guys? The header. So. The main header, I will change the color to, let's say, red, for instance. And I will change the font family. So just to play, I will start with Courier. 
I'll make it bigger, so I will play on the font size this time. Which size for the font size of the main title? Beam, a big, big header, OK? And then I will pick some color. So let's start with red and maybe try to enhance it a bit afterwards with some nice tools. And so I'm making the same for H2. So H2, actually, I want the design for the font I suggest you use, except for the main title, for the rest of the headers, choose some font size which are small. It will be a more like elegant design. If you go on Airbnb, look at the headers, the H2. They are small, like 17 pixels, something like that. It's never like big, because you need to put some content, so you need to have some space in your page. So let's say like 18 pixels, and let's keep them black. And now if I want to kill the, the style of my links, because the links they are ugly, they are blue and underlined, so I can kill the text decoration here with this property, text decoration none. I can change the color. And here I will introduce a new selector. So A, it selects all the A guys, right? H2, it selects all the H2 guys. And if I want to select the A, the A tag, but when it's hovered by the mouse, I've got this new selector. It means that I designed the A element, but when it's hovered by the mouse. OK? And when it's hovered, basically, I don't want any text decoration. And maybe I want the color to change to, let's say, green. OK? So let's see what's happening to our web page. Wow. So the main title is red with a courier font. All the body is uh, Helvetica for the rest of the okay, for the rest of the um, of the the, the, the the paragraph of text and the headers. The uh, the link is not un underlined. It's blue and it's green when I hover on it, and that's pretty much it. So I've got my first design. Now I'm going to use some web services to custom to customize it a bit. So for the coolers, uh, I've got two good services. The first is coolers.co. So actually, it's kind of a, 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 fancy, a fancy service. You have a kind of generator here. You start the generator. You hit the space button. And it gives you some color scheme with the hexadecimal value here that you can copy paste. And when you like a color, you can you know, come and click on it. It's a lock, it locks the color. And you keep having some complementary nice colors. So here, I can just choose this one. And I keep having the, the complementary colors of these two, these two colors. So the first resource, uh, and the other one is like colorhunt.co. That's a new one. Actually, there are nice color scheme on this one. Because colors is, is just about finding the good colors that fit together, just not the single color that you can use. But the thing I do the most uh, is like I go on web page, uh, and I use what we call a color picker. So that's a, a plugin, or you know, I've got the, a Mac application for that purpose. So I click on it here, and then uh, when you hover on the page, uh, you can basically pick any color you want. So if I like this orange color here, I just click here. I go back to my code. Uh, and for the H1, instead of the red, uh, I will inject this guy here, this orange. And if I go back, uh, okay. if I go back on my page here, then this is the same orange for my main header. Okay. So I suggest uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Just pick colors from from uh, well-designed websites with kind of co with color pickers. In the web in the slides, I give you some color picker that you can install. So okay, so that's it for the for the colors. You have two resources plus the color picker, and you can do pretty much uh, like all, all the things you need. And for the fonts, there is one one really famous service which is Google Fonts. So how does it work? It's a bit like Amazon. You, you do your shopping with the fonts. So I go on Google Fonts, and I'm just going to, to pick the nice ones. So the first one that I see is OpenSan, this one. And basically, OpenSan is the, the one that you can choose for the body, for the main text. Like 90% of the website, they use OpenSan. They don't just like think about it. They just, just pick OpenSan. And so I will just add it to my cart. On the right, I click on Add to Collection. And as you can see, at the bottom, it's in my basket. I'm ready to check out. But I can keep shopping. So I need a, a font for my headers. So I give you the one I like on Google Fonts. There is Roboto. 
Roboto is like uh, elegant and uh, with nice, nice characters, a bit thin. And there is another one I like is Montserrat. I don't know, the, all the fonts that have some kind of French name, I think. <laughs> so Montserrat is this one. It looks a bit like the product and uh, font. It's kind of bold, okay? And it's nice to have a contrast between the headers and the text. So let's take a bold one for the headers and a, a light open song for the, for, for the text. So I add this one to the collection and then I check out by clicking on news, okay? And here it goes. Here, Google font is really nice. It, it, I can select the different uh, versions of the font I need. So for the open song, I want to have the light version, the normal version, and the bold one to have some contrast, to contrast on my text, some thin characters and some bold characters. And on, on the Montserrat, I will pick the, the normal one and the bold one, okay? Then I, sc I scroll on the page, and what does it say here, actually? Add this code to your website. So this is a link to a style sheet. So for sure, it's not a style sheet which is locally on our computer. It's actually on a URL in the server of Google. But still, it's a bit the same. It's a link to a file, okay? So I'll go in the head here, and is it above my personal style sheet or, or below? Yeah, it matters because I need to use the Google font in my CSS to say my header will be Montserrat, my, you know, my body will be open sans. So I need to load the font before my own design, my own CSS code, right? So before, actually. And so I keep scrolling and here, like, everything is written for me. If you want to design anything, you use this, these style rules here. So I just copy-paste this one, font family open sans. And open sans is for which elements of my page? It's for this one, for the main text, it's open song. So I just copy paste it here, right? And this one, Montserrat, it's for the H1, and let's say also the H2, for all my headers. Now if I go back to my landing page and I refresh, then it's like this one is Montserrat here, and this one here is open song. Okay? And it starts to look like, like, like a landing page. We just need to put some background to center the text, to put the features in the grid, in a responsive grid with Bootstrap, and boom, that's it. So, to save time again, because we are a bit out of time, if you scroll on the third exercise, you have the link here to your style sheet. Normally, you already have the style.css file. Don't, and here, you have a starting point for the CSS, but with ugly choices. So like big text, green ones. So play a bit with that to change the values, to, to, to put some Google fonts, and to kind of have some, kind of, uh, some personal code, okay? But to save time, copy paste the starting points. Now we are going to go into more advanced design of the web page. And the first thing we need to, to, to do is to group the information that fit together. Because if you go on the real life website, so that's the previous version of Airbnb, as you can see, there are some information that are grouped together different sections within the page. So for instance, here there is the navigation bar with the logo and uh, the form and the links. Here we have the map. And on the right, you have all the cards with the image of the flat, the image of the owner, the title of the, and they are grouped within kind of boxes, different boxes, right? Yeah. And in the HTML, we do that with the div tag. So we will just wrap all the content that fits together within a box with the div tag. That's how we, we, we put different boxes into our, our design. Okay, so as you can see here, there's the D for the navbar, the D for the map, a, a, a D for any flat of the, of the search. And when you have a div, you, you can represent it as a box and you can play on lots of different parameters. So here I have, a, a, I have represented my box as a yellow one, right? And you can start to play in the CSS on the width and the height of the content of the box. What did I teach you today? Height. Height. <laughs> so you can play on the width and on the height of the content. So be careful because in CSS, width and height, that doesn't mean width of the box. That means width of the content of the box. So that's a kind of a false friend. It's not a, uh, it doesn't mean the width of the box, it's the, the width of the content of the box, right? And then you can play on other stuff. You can play on the internal space, between the border and the content of the box, and that's called padding in CSS. And you can play on the external margin between the box and what's surrounding the box. 
and that's called margin in CSS. So padding is like internal space, Ma margin is like actually external margin. Remember that. And then we can also play on the border, because if you have a box, you can just decide to have a border for the box. And how do you define a border? What do you need to define to have a border? The width of the border, one pixel, two pixel, three pixel, the color of the border, and the style of the border. Is it a, a solid border, a dashed border, this kind of stuff. And you can do it like that in the CSS. So here, for instance, I've got the first one, which is a border of one pixel, which is a solid border, and it, it's green, actually. OK? That's how you specify the border of the box. The other thing you can do is play on the radius. So this one is really nice. If you want to have like rounded corners, you can play on the, on the border radius in CSS. So here it's five pixels because that means that you can put some kind of small circle in the corner that will just, you know, correspond to the, to the, to the round, to the, I don't know how to say that in English, sorry. But imagine you put a, a circle in the corner. So imagine you have a square, a, a, a box which is like 100 pixel, 100 pixel. What's the border radius to make it a circle? You have a square, 100 pixel, 100 pixel. Yeah, 50 pixel, right? So if you want to make an avatar picture, for instance, a profile picture, and you have a square picture, you put a border radius of half the width, and beam, that's a circle, right? That's how you make a circle. And you can also play on the shadow of uh, what we call the box shadow. So to define a shadow, we have to say, of how many pixels do we shift the shadow uh, horizontally? What's the shift of the shadow vertically? What's the level of blur of the shadow? Is it a really a sharp shadow or a blurred shadow? And what's the color of the shadow? Is it a black shadow, a green shadow, a yellow shadow? OK? And we are done. We have specified all the parameters for the shadow. So the first thing we need to do, and I won't let you have time for that because it's really straightforward, is we need to wrap the content that, that goes together in our page within div, right? So help me do that. I mean, my HTML here. What, what are the content that, that goes together? Where do I put my div? Yeah, I have the main banner describing the service, so I take the content here and I hit tab to indent all of it in one click, okay? And then I have a div, a box for each feature because I want to design all of my features, right? So I need to put a div here around the first feature and I have to do the same for each feature of my, of my page because I want maybe to put some border around this feature or play on the background, or maybe play on the border radius or whatever. So I have to encapsulate it into a div. So let's make the same here, here. That's not the most interesting part of the workshop. And then, I let you think about the end. At the end of the page, what do I have? A footer. And if I want to have a dark background for my footer, I need also to put some kind of box around. So I need to put my footer paragraph of text within a div here. OK? So do you think something will happen in the, in the browser? Will the page change? What do you think? If I refresh the page, will it change? No, because actually my HTML structure is richer. You know, I can do lots of stuff with it, but for, for the moment I don't have uh, written any design, I can't see it, it's just that my HTML is, is, more, is smarter, right? And I, now I can do stuff with it. And as you can see in my inspector, now my HTML structure is much richer. So I've got some, this box, I can see them. The first one, the second one, the third one. And if I select this one, just to show you, I can start to play on the design. So on the right, I will start to write some CSS code. So let's start sh changing the background. So what do I write? Background, and maybe put it white. You see the difference between the body background and the box background? If I want to put some exter external margin, what's the property for that? Margin. And then look, if I just put some margin, what's happening? It's the external margin, okay? Between the box and what's surrounding the box. If I want to play on the internal space, what's the property for that? Padding. Padding. And here, my, my external margin the same, but I play on the internal space of my box, okay? 
to space the content, to, put, uh, to make it breathe. What can I play? What other parameters? I can play on the border radius. So let's make it like 3 pixel. So here, okay, I'm just putting some rounded corners on my div. And what's the last one we've seen? The bug shadow. So what do I need to specify for a bug shadow? Horizontal translation. Vertical translation. Level of blur. <laughs> and color. So let's say green, for instance. So here I have like a, an ugly, an ugly uh, green shadow. And I will give you my pro tip to design a shadow. So small shift. Small horizontal and vertical shift, small level of blur, and then for the color of the shadow, you click on the color here, you, you start by picking the background, that means that we can't see the shadow because it's the color of the background, but then I can start to play here on the color picker to, to just make, make it a bit darker than the background, like that. Actually, if the user is seeing the shadow, that means that your shadow is shit. Because in design, what you see is, w is not well designed. It, it has to be so subtle that you r don't really see it. You just notice it if you, uh, you try to you know, go a bit, further, like a bit closer like that. Oh, this is a good bug shadow. <laughs> OK, so that's my, my, tr my, my pro tip for the bug shadow. Anyway, I, I let you like maybe 30 seconds to, to wrap your content in div, indent what's inside the div, and then we go on. So just uh, what's the issue with our HTML for the moment? Ima let's imagine that I want to design this banner. What's the, what's the standard way of designing a banner on a landing page? With a background image, right? You have a background image with the name of the service, the, the tagline, and the button. But the thing is, like, if I start by doing that in my CSS, OK, I select all the div tag, and I put some background image on it. What's going to happen, actually? What will happen? OK, so maybe we have to design the banner, but what's the problem here? I select which ones? All the div of my website. So not only my banner here will have a background, but all my feature here will also have a background image. Because my selector is too weak, it selects all the div on my page, and will put some background image on all the div on my page. And you agree with me that's not what I want, that's not the design I want. So here I'm a bit stuck, because I need a way in my HTML to basically like, like se um, select indep independently the different div on my page. So, and I have to introduce a new thing, which is ID and class. That's really an important part of HTML, CSS. So let's pretend uh, I have an image for my logo and a list of images for the staff of my team, OK? With the different profile pictures of my team. And let's say I want to design the logo only and resize the logo with a width of 40 pixels. You agree with me that if I do that with the EMG selector, What's going to happen? Yeah, they're all going to change. So I need to, to find a way to, to target just my logo. And for that, I will use in the HTML an attribute which is called the ID. Okay? The ID is a way to name my logo. And the good thing is like when you have an ID on a, an element of your page, then you are able to select it in the CSS with a new selector, which starts with a hashtag, is the, is the ID selector. And here in the CSS, I select the element of my page with the ID logo. So that will only select my logo, but not the other images. So ID selector with a hashtag. Now let's imagine that I want to design my picture staff, uh, my, the, the, the pictures of my staff. Make, it, make, make them circled and shadowed or whatever. Here, when it's kind of a reusable design, the uh, design that you want to reuse in several parts of your website, you don't use an ID. An ID is for an indi like a, a unique thing. You will use a class, OK? So it's a bit the same principle. Here, I got the class staff for my staff pictures. And the selector in the CSS, it starts with a dot. So that's the class selector. Here in my CSS, I select all the guys who have the, the class staff. And I put them some some border radius of uh, 50%. That won't affect my logo. Now that we know that, um, when do you need an ID or a class? You need the ID when it's a unique element. Because the, the ID is really precise. It's more precise than the class, actually. OK, so it's for un unique elements, like the logo. And the class, you, you use it when it's a reusable 
uh, design class that you want to use in several parts of your HTML. Okay? And the nice thing when you, when you really are a good CSS designer and you, you, you will combine the class to have different design applying and combining. Instead of having big, uh, one big class that does everything, the coffee, you know, it, uh, the, it makes the dinner, it makes the shopping, you, have, you separate all these design uh, rules in, two, in, di in different uh, classes and then you can combine them. Okay, I want to be bordered and shadowed and rounded and whatever. So here, for instance, I've got this class that makes my image rounded. I can combine it with a second class that makes my image also with a shadow. But I can use this class independently also. That's where my code is good, actually, because it's, it's separated. And here in the last example, on the first image of, you know these guys? I don't know if you know. I don't know. We don't know him in French, so I don't. OK, so here, if I want to, um, to put an idea on the first one, you see that everything is combining the style of my class and the style of my idea. That means that Paul McCartney was also like a red, red border. So let's name the tags in our HTML. Here, we are basically going to name all the div to basically be able to design it a different way. So how do I name this, this one here? With an idea or a class? Well, yeah, it's unique. It's my banner, right? And so I can call it whatever I want. So let's call it banner, OK? These four guys, this one, this one, this one, and this one, are they unique? There are four of them, so I will use a class. And let's say card or feature, whatever, okay? Some meaningful word. And the last guy, is it unique? Yeah, so, and how, what's the name I will use? Footer. Okay, so now let's design the banner. So here it's all the design for my font and color. Now we are trying to make some custom design here. Okay, just to give you a, a bit uh, about the overview of the file, here it's like font and colors only. And here we're starting to make some custom design on class and ID. Okay, just to give you a bit the skeleton of the file. So how do I select the banner? What's the selector for the banner? Is it an ID or a class? ID. So it starts with a hashtag and then the name banner. And here I select the banner. OK? So what's the, the graphical properties of the banner? What does it look like? I have to find some background image. That's the, the, that's the banner design, right? So I will put some background image. And here I'm a bit lazy, so I won't, use, I won't download an image. I will use a placeholder service. So I show you the one I, I like a lot. It's like called Unsplash and splash it and basically give you some URL of image. When you are prototyping, you don't want to, you know, you want to save time and just make some tests with images, you can pick them here. So let's use, and here in the URL with this service, you can specify the width and the height of the image, right? So if it's for a banner, so it's a big image for the background. So let's maybe take 1000 pixel width and maybe 6,000 pixels for the height. And let's see what happens on the, on the design of my page. OK, do you like it? What is missing, actually? Lots of stuff. Yeah, so the box, it doesn't breathe. There is no internal space in the box. So how do I add some internal space? OK, I have to add some padding. So for the padding, you can specify the padding top, right, bottom, left in one single number like that. Or you can decide to say, OK, I want 150 pixels for top and bottom, and let's say 0 for left and right. Okay, you, you can write it this way. Then what do I need to do on the text line of my text? I have to center the text, right, for the, for the, content to be, the text content to be centered. And I think I will pick maybe another, maybe a random image that will be like, that will be fun. When I refresh, then it's random. Surprise. OK. So it's like that. What is missing, actually, to make a banner? Can you notice something? The, the, text. the background is being repeated. OK, the text, we can't see it. It's black on, like, so we have to make the text which color? Which color? 
white, right? OK. Here you can see that the background is repeated. So for that, you have a property which is background size. And you have the keyword cover that will make the, the image cover the div, actually. And so here it covers the div. And here we go into more advanced design. So that's the ID selector. I select the, the element with the ID banner. Which, what is nice with that is now I can dive into my element to design the inner elements. And how do I do that? I select the banner, space, and then I dive into it to select the H1. I, do, I don't want to affect all the H1 of my, my website, just the H1 within my banner elements. And maybe let's put it white. And if I want to select my paragraph of text, what do I do? Here, P. OK? And maybe for the paragraph of text, maybe let's put it like a bit bigger because it's small at the moment. So font size, 30 pixels, let's say. Something like that. OK, we have to have a, a nice one. And that's it. It is a banner, right? We just need to have some button design here. So my advice here is like to have a contrast between the main header and the, and the subtitle here. So I suggest you use a font weight which is lighter for the paragraph of text. And you can also change a bit the color of the text. And for that, you can maybe put some opacity, some transparency. So the main header will be bold and white, and the, the subtitle will be thin and a bit transparent. Okay? So maybe 0.6, 0.7. And then you, you have really a contrast between the main title and, this, and the, the cache line that everyone is reading, actually. Now what do we need to do on these guys? What can we do? Not, not really much. Maybe center the text. So how do I select the, my cards? What's the class name? Card. It's card, right? So what do I do? OK, I select the card. And let's just put some internal space. I don't know. And puts also like text, uh, text align center. And what about the footer? It's the worst footer of the, of the history of the footer. <laughs> you agree with me? So what do I need to do? Select it. Is it an idea or uh, a class? OK, so footer. What background for the footer? Black. OK, let's. We don't have time. Let's make dirty quick design. What's the color for the text? White. What's the font, way, font size? It's a bit small, so I will like 20 pixels. Do the footer need to breathe a bit, like some, with some kind of internal space? Yeah, it deserves to breathe a bit. So padding, whatever. It doesn't breathe, actually. <laughs> padding. OK, and we have a footer here. So sometimes the browser here, Chrome, is putting some margin on the body. Sometimes it happens. So for that, you can just kill the margin here with margin 0. So that is sticking, you know, sticking to the, to the page. So that begins to look as a landing page, right? So for the footer, I show you some other service. So always, when you're designing something, you need some utility icons, OK, for a, a mail envelope. Um, a map marker, the Google map marker, a dollar, whatever, like all the Twitter logo, these kind of small icons. And it's not really good to have image files, because if you need to change the color, then you have to change to open some graphical software and change it. If you need to, to resize the icons, you'd have to do the same. So for these icons, like these utility icons, it's really not convenient to use like really uh, image files. And there is a really cool library, which is called Fontosum, and it is a font of icon. So imagine it's like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but A is like the Twitter logo, B is the Facebook logo, C is the mail envelope, D is like the map marker, and so on. So what's cool with that is like when we want to resize, it's just CSS, font size 20 pixels, and the image is big. If you want to make it red, color red, because it behaves like a text, it is a font of icon. So it's really straightforward to use. You just go on font awesome here. And uh, it's a bit as uh, Google Fonts. They say, OK, get started on the, on the top navigation here. And here, you can just copy-paste this part. 
that's the link to the CSS file of Fontosam and put it where? OK, here. And then uh, that's done. We have Fontosam and we can look for icons. So let's say I want to look for the Facebook icon. I look for Facebook and then here it is. <coughs> and it tells me like I have to put this, this I tag in my HTML. And that's it. I've got an icon. So here what we can do in the footer here, we can have a list of links, a navigation with different links to the different social networks of the web page. OK? Twitter, Facebook. So what's a, a list of links? It's like UL with different list items inside. And within each list item, an A, a link, A. So let's keep maybe four links. And here, within the text of the link, I will use an icon, a font of some icon. So for the first, first one, it will be Facebook. For the second one, let's guess. OK? Uh, then whatever. And then now that you're a developer, already like nearly, GitHub, right? And if I go here, as you can see, I've got my links here. OK, so of course, uh, that will be better that if they are horizontal, but I show you with Bootstrap just one class and beam they are horizontal. What can I do in the CSS for these links? Change the color. So how do I select these guys? They are part of the footer. So I select the footer and select the A guys. And the, these icons, they are texts. So I can manipulate them as texts. So if I want them to be big, I just change their font size. If I want them to be gray, I just make them gray. OK? They just behave as text. So I can just make whatever I want on them. If I want that when I hover on them, they turn white, I just can do it like that. I select them in their hover state, and I change their color. OK? And now, when I hover on the guy, they are white. So who have heard about Bootstrap? It's mainly a CSS file already coded by the guys from Twitter. So basically, if you open the file uh, of Bootstrap, it's just a big, big CSS file, such as our CSS file, with lots of class already implemented, like the class button uh, primary, it's for the blue button, like the class list inline, it's for inlining a list. So you don't have to code all the CSS, they already they have done the job, and they have this big, big file with lots of class that you can use in the HTML. So when you do Bootstrap, basically, you just do HTML with the, the right class. But you don't write a lot of CSS, because they did the, the work for you. So we have a bit of setup, like one minute of setup to do. So here in the, in the workshop description, I put you the skeleton for the bootstrap. So when you, you start a bootstrap uh, uh, HTML file, you need to load bootstrap. And you need also to have some kind of line in the head to detect the device on which you are, to apply some kind of responsive behavior. So you have to start with the good canvas. And here it is. So we just copy paste this canvas here and create the, the really the, the, the definitive landing page. So I create a new file and I will name it index.html. And here I will start with this canvas. So it's close to the one we had with the title here, the link to Bootstrap here, the link to Fontosum here, the link to our own personal style sheet here. And at the bottom there are some links because Bootstrap it already has a, a JavaScript file for animated components. But we don't really care about the, the line at the bottom. So what do I need to do now? OK, to take my content from here and copy paste it. So I just take all these guys and put them in my, def in my final uh, file here. The other thing I need to do is like here in the head, we don't have the Google font link because it's a, a starting point. So we don't have any Google font link. So I just take the Google Fonts link here, and I just add them in the head section just before my style. And before Bootstrap, it doesn't really matter, actually. And we are done with the playground that was just for kids. Now we are with the index.html file, and we can just open it here. So now we have Bootstrap, OK? And we have Bootstrap mainly with this link here, this one. Can you see it? It's a link to the CSS file of Bootstrap. 
And that's it, Bootstrap is just a big CSS file hosted on this URL, on this CDN. And now we can use it. So first you have to know that the color scheme of Bootstrap is based on semantic keywords. So it's not blue, green, red, it's like primary, success, info, warning, danger. And danger is red, primary is blue, success is green. So you have to, to, to know this keyword in Bootstrap. All right? Let's start with the most common one. So in Bootstrap, you have some utility class to align the text. You don't need to write CSS. You just you want to center a text, class, text center, and that's centered. OK? Then you have the class for the button design. So you have a, 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 a link, A. You want, to, you want it to look like a button. So you have the main class, BTN. BTN, BTN. It's for the main design of the button. And then you have a second class for the different variants. BTN primary, that's for the blue button. BTN warning, for the, the, the orange button, and so on. And that's it. You don't have to write the CSS. You just apply the class, and the CSS is already in the CSS file of Bootstrap. OK? List in line. So for the footer, it's actually it's like maybe 10 or 15 lines of CSS to make an inline design for a list. And it's already in Bootstrap, so list in line on my list URL, and that's in line. OK? Image, e EMG circle. You want an avatar, EMG circle. It's, OK, it's that's one line of CSS border radius 50%, but still, you don't have to write it, so you use it. Let's kind of bootstrap, bootstrapize, bootstrapize? Yeah? <laughs> All the things we can bootstrapize. So let's bootstrapize this guy now. It's, uh, it doesn't look good. So what's the design for him? A button. So it's this guy, the A. So I will add a class of bootstrap. So the main one is BTN. That's the common class for all button. And then I've got the second class for the precise design I want. So BTN primary, that makes a blue button, OK? BTN danger, that makes a red button. I think I've got some opacity. Why do I? I think I have some opacity on the banner. Yeah, maybe I just get rid of it. And also, if you want a big button, you have other class, BTN, LG, large. And here, I've got a bigger button. OK? What about this guy, this list? What's the class for, for this list? So I give you the, the convention of Bootstrap. It's always the component dash the design. So if it's a list, it's like list dash inline, right? For the button, it's like button. Button is the name of the component. Dash primary, like blue. If it's a form, form dash inline, if you want a search form horizontal. So they have a kind of the same convention to name that makes it easy to, re to remember, actually. So list inline. And here, we have an horizontal list for the footer here, for the, for the links. I don't know if you can see it. As on any footer, actually. The good thing with Bootstrap is like their documentation on getbootstrap.com is really, really well done with lots of examples of code. And that's why, actually, that's the most contributed project on GitHub. And that's one of the most, like, mostly used uh, projects by developers in all the startups world. Because their documentation is really good, actually. That's a, one of the reasons why. And the other reason why is because they have a grid system. So what's a grid system about? As you can see, like in our page, all the features are one above the other. But that's not, uh, that's not the way you design a website. You want to have some items next, one next to each other. And ideally, you want that when you resize your device, the, the cards, they, they will change the, you know, the, the, the positioning of the card will change. So let's say on a, a mobile, you have full screen cards, one above the other. When you are on a tablet, you have one here, one here, and two below. And on big be a big screen, you have all the cards one next to each other on a single row. That's the kind of uh, behavior you want for, for a website. Because imagine everyone is like small on a, on a device like a mobile. Everyone is one to each other. Then you can't see the text. It's like everyone is like, don't have space. And for that, it's hard to do in CSS. And hopefully, we have the grid system of Bootstrap. So now is the time where you really have to focus, because that's the five last minutes, but that's not really the most easy to understand. I try to make it easy. 
So the grid system is responsive, so that means that the grid will adapt depending on the device on which you are. And we have to think about the mobile design when we design a grid in Bootstrap. And then think about like, just making your screen bigger mentally. <coughs> so how does it work? <coughs> it always starts the same way. You start with a Bootstrap container. So that's the div with the class container. So here I represent a container. And inside its container, I will inject some rows. OK? So here I've got a first row in purple, a second one. So a row is just another div with the class row. And here I, I have a third row in my container. Right? So the, the tricky part is like for the moment, I've, uh, I have some kind of blocks in my row. You agree with me? So in the first one, I have 12 ones, 12 uh, blocks. In the second row, I have four, one, four blocks. But I have not written the code for them because it's too long to write. But the first thing to keep in mind is like you have a container and you can inject rows inside. And then it's a bit as Lego. You have a row and you can push some bricks inside. And you have to, to understand that Bootstrap is based on 12 columns. That means that when you have a row, the space is divided by, in 12 columns. So if I want to have 12 blocks, then I have to add 12 blocks of one column on the row. If I want four blocks, as in the second row, I will push four blocks, and each of the blocks will take three columns. That's OK. So I have a container. I put some row inside. And within the row, I can just push some, some blocks that takes a certain number of columns inside, up to 12. So how, would, how do we fill the rows? What's the code for these kind of guys taking a certain number of columns? It looks like that. So the class is like call, because it takes a number of columns. Then dash the device on which it will apply. So XS, it stands for extra small. That means mobile device. So that's the class that will apply on a mobile. And then six, what does it mean, six? It takes six columns. So in English, in really like good English, what does this guy mean, this guy? I am a block which is taking half the screen only on mobile. That's what it means. So XS is like extra small, it's like mobile. SM is not what you think, it's like small, so it's like a tablet. MD is like medium. And LG is like large desktop, OK? So MD is laptop, and LG is desktop. So if I say uh, call SM4, um, what is this guy about? It's a block that takes one third of the screen, four columns, on the tablet. Call MD3, that's the guy taking one quarter of the screen on the laptop. So let's take an example with two, with two guys, two blocks. So this is a pretty simple example. So we have one row only with two blocks inside. And each of these blocks is taking half the screen, so six columns. So the nice thing with Bootstrap is you don't have to specify all the different class. That means that it's always the previous one that will keep applying. So here, it's like six columns on mobile. But mentally, if you increase the, the device, it's still six. So it will be half the screen for any mobile, unless you override with a new class. Otherwise, it's still applying on bigger screens. And now what's happening if I do that? In a row, I put three guys of six columns. What's happening? Actually, it's not a big deal. It's just uh, some, some guy who doesn't have enough space, so he just go, you know, in the next line. And that's actually a good behavior to have, because with this behavior, we, really, we can build some responsive things. So I think like everything will become clear with the live code. Let's say I want to inject my cards, these guys, in a grid. My advice is always cut the grid from scratch without content and then inject the content in the grid. So a grid starts with a container. And then inside the container, we can inject some rows. So it's the div with the class row. And inside this row, we're going to fill the row with call. OK? So for the card, I want to start. Let's start with mobile, XS. So how many, how many columns on mobile? 12, right? So if, if we just keep it that way, it will still be 12 on any mobile. But then we can try to make, make the next breakpoints. So imagine we want to switch on tablets. And on tablets, what will be cool is like to have one feature, one feature, and below 
the two other ones. That make every feature to take how many columns? Six. So I change it to six for tablets. And from the medium device, that means from the laptop and bigger ones, I want to switch to how many columns? Three. That means like three, 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 three. They can all go on the, on the same line and take one quarter of the, of the, of the width of the screen. Okay? So how many blocks do I need of these guys? How many? Four. I need four. Okay? I need four guys. And here, now that I have my responsive grid, what can I do? I can inject the card inside, okay? So this card here, I'll inject it in the first grid here, this card here in the second one, and so on. Okay, and this one in the last column. And let's see what's, what's happening. So let's start with mobile, okay? We're on mobile. So on mobile, it's how many column? 12. So each card is taking all the screen. Let's make it bigger. <coughs> let's make it bigger until we go to the tablet format. So that means like here. Here we're on an, an iPad, on a tablet. That makes every call is taking six. And then if I get bigger, the laptop, small laptop, it's, uh, it's uh, taking just three columns. Okay? And actually, you can do pretty much, if you want, okay, I make something stupid, right? I just go back to 12 here. That's stupid, huh? That's not good responsive behavior, but still, uh, just to show you that you can just override it and have all the behavior that you want, actually. So here, it's a bit stupid. Huh? It's like, it's 12, huh? we go to 6, and we go back to 12 on medium device, OK? And also, I can skip one. So if I, I can skip the 6 here, and I go back to 3 on this one, what's happening? So I start at 12 on XS. And then, actually, there is no one overriding XS. So it's still applying on until the breakpoint, which is laptop, not tablet, because I got rid of the tablet uh, design. So I keep 12 on tablets. And my next, my next breakpoint is medium, right? So here on medium, boom, I got to, the, to this design. We try to target beginners. So we want really to give you so lots of information. I think you're a bit overloaded at this moment. But I hope that you, 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 you get something out of it. And for those of you who really want to go into a, 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 like a developer, not, not necessarily a developer career, but be able to basically build web products, not just front-end, but real web products. We have the nine-week course that uh, starts in July, actually. So if you're interested or if you just want to discuss about it uh, with us, we can have an interview, like uh, plan some, uh, some meeting, have a drink, and discuss about, uh, I don't know, what's your expectations and uh, about the program. Thank you, guys. Thank you.